Independent research undertaken in 2019 identified these impacts in more detail, and we acted, we acted on after public uh, uh, consultation to regulate short-term lets to address this. Licensing offers reassurance providing protection and benefits for all businesses, guests, neighbours and communities all across Scotland. It puts in place a formal framework with conditions that responsible businesses should already be functioning within. Willie Rennie. Uh, the Minister knows that I favour sensible controls and regulation. That's why I favour the control areas. But he needs to listen to the strength of the opposition, to the licensing arrangements. This is really strong. At a time of great economic strain, these regulations, I think, are heavy-handed. And there's also been the subject of mission creep. Why doesn't the Minister understand the strength of feeling and reflect on that? Minister. Yeah, I, I have, and I said, in the first day that I engaged in the role, I was in the role, I engaged with the sector straight off. I've met with them twice since then. I've met numerous local authorities talking about that. The licensing schemes, this is coming straight from Solar, the licensing scheme themselves, who think it's a proportionate response to what came through in the public consultation in 2019. We'll continue to listen to stakeholders going forward, but this is a proportionate response to what came through in the 2019 consultation. Thank you. We move on to question two, and I call Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many public buildings are currently at risk due to the exposure of reinforced autoclave aerated concrete? Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Survey work is underway across the public sector. Where the presence of RAC is confirmed in a public building, we expect the owner to take appropriate measures to manage any risk identified. We expect risk assessment of buildings with a confirmed RAC presence and recommendations for mitigation to follow the current guidance published by the Institution of Structural Engineers. Returns from councils do confirm some presence in 37 schools. Councils have reassured ministers that in the small number of schools where RAC is present, appropriate mitigation plans are in place. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful for that response and I must thank the Liberal Democratic Party for their FOIs that raised this issue um, as early as May this year. But it has been something that the government, both north and south of the border, have apparently been aware of for a number of years. So can the Scottish Government confirm that when they are aware of the list of public buildings that are at risk, they will publish that list, keep it updated, and also ensure what steps have been taken to make sure the building is still safe to open? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this has, of course, been a, an issue that the government has been aware of for some time, and that's why action has being, is being undertaken and has been for some time. For example, uh, we back in July 22, uh, Scottish government officials made contact with the Scottish heads of property services, for example, um, and directors of education in Scotland uh, to share information um, on RAC. So that work has been ongoing for some time. I can completely appreciate why there is a public concern on this, particularly given the way that announcements have been handled down in England. But can I reassure the member that we appreciate that public concern means we need to be as open as possible as we can be for this, because parents and staff are concerned about this issue. It is for councils, I think, of course, to publish that information on schools eh, alongside communication with parents and staff, because it's important that we reassure them, both at a national and a local level, about the mitigations that are already being taken place. Eh, so I do confirm. Thank that you. We, do we will now to move on to, as... to Martin Whitfield. Thank you. I'm grateful for the confirmation that, that that list will be published. Indeed, will what follow from that support for our local authorities with regard to the money that is required, first to ensure that the surveys are taken properly, that the mitigation measures are correct and appropriate, and indeed that they are supported, particularly for some buildings. I'm thinking of particularly some schools that have lost out because of the lack of publication of the Learning Estate Investment Programme. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as I mentioned, it, it is for local authorities to publish that information um, on schools, and they should uh, do so to ensure that parents and staff um, are reassured. Uh, can I again reassure uh, the member that both myself and uh, Jenny Gilruth, the Education Secretary, uh, are in regular contact with COSLA uh, to ensure that we are offering support where that is uh, needed uh, and ensuring that we are sharing good practice and information and reaffirming the importance of looking at that professional advice that came from the Institution of Structural Engineers. And we will, of course, keep up that contact, that very close contact uh, with local authorities as this situation develops. I call Bill Kidd. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Recognising that any repairs will result in additional spending commitments for the responsible bodies, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussion has been had with the UK Government on capital funding to remediate where the material is found in buildings? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in her letter of the 3rd of September, the Cabinet Secretary for Education asked the UK Secretary of State for Education to clarify the public commitment made by the Chancellor to spend what it takes to make schools safe. That statement was welcomed and early details of the financial support package, which would then follow to devolved governments, is sought. This follows an earlier letter on the 16th of August from the Deputy First Minister to HM Treasury regarding further financial support to help to deal with the consequences of RAC, to which we have yet to receive a reply. It is essential that we do receive early, early clarity on this matter. Craig Hoy. Officer, in Preston Lodge and Preston Pans, 20 classrooms are closed and S1 pupils are being taught uh, off campus. East Lothian Council has already spent over £300,000 to maintain education standards, a sum which is not budgeted for at a time of extreme financial pressure for the Council. Will the Cabinet Secretary therefore commit to reimbursing councils and health boards which have incurred significant non-construction and inspection related costs due to the discovery of RAC? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, can I uh, refer the member to the answer that I've uh, just uh, given? This is clearly an issue that is affecting administrations right across the United Kingdom, and it is important that the UK Government and the Chancellor take cognizance of that. We are working at a time where uh, we are already having uh, cuts made to our capital budgets. That is making it difficult across government to fulfil uh, the obligations we already have. Uh, of course, we are committed to working with local authorities, but there is, quite frankly, uh, um, presiding officer, an obligation on the UK government to also step up and ensure that everybody is supported on this issue. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. It's now been months since I first brought this issue to the attention of the very top of the Scottish government, and there is still no central register of affected buildings, no strategy for the swift and wholesale replacement of this potentially deadly concrete, and no national fund for cash strapped schools, health boards, and others landed with it. Mitigation and monitoring offers little reassurance when a concrete beam that was marked as safe collapsed, prompting the closure of schools across. England. So can the Cabinet Secretary say with confidence today that pupils, patients and staff don't have rack in the ceilings above them? And is it possible that there are classrooms and wards with this problem concrete still in use right now? Cabinet Secretary. Well, with the greatest respect to Mr Cole Hamilton, he did not bring this to the eyes um, of the Scottish Government. We are already well aware of it for some time and have already had plans in place. That is why there are uh, discovery um, methods already in place right across government and the public sector on this issue. And can I urge him to have some caution about what he is advising here? Can I urge him, please? to respect the advice of the Institute of Structural Engineers, which has not changed over the past week, despite what's been happening in England. Let's listen to that professional advice. Let's pay close attention, of course, if that does change, but it has not. And let's ensure that we listen to the professionals, we listen to the experts. We, of course, take action where it's needed, and that's exactly why mitigation measures are already in place where RAC has been identified and those mitigation measures have been required. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. In December 2021, the Government told Parliament it would publish in 2022 the schools that would form Phase 3 of the Learning Estate Investment Programme. They failed to do so in May and then in June, the Education Secretary said there would be an announcement by the summer recess, but failed to deliver that announcement. So could the Cabinet Secretary tell us how many schools like Dumfries Academy are at risk due to RAC, where the refurbishment or the rebuild is being held up because of the failure of the Government to announce the funding they promised they would announce months ago? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think there are two, with great respect, there's two different issues here, uh, Presiding Officer. Yes, we are, of course, working very closely with the councils where RAC has been identified, I've said in my previous answers. When it comes to the announcement um, of LEAP Phase 3, uh, I would hope that everyone across the Chamber recognises the very difficult circumstances for all capital projects at the moment, particularly because of increasing capital costs, increasing construction costs, and the implications that has. Now, I think it's quite right at that time 
that government does take longer than perhaps people would like uh, to us to ensure that we're getting the maximum out of that project and looking at that very seriously. And of course, the Cabinet Secretary for Education uh, will make an announcement on that in due course when we are ready to do so. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Hamza Youssef on programme for government 2023 to 2024. The First Minister's statement will be followed by a debate and so there should be no interventions or interruptions during the statement. And I call on the First Minister up to 30 minutes, please. Presiding Officer, I have often talked about my paternal grandfather, Mohammed Youssef, over the last few months. I've commented on his journey from Pakistan to Paul Shields, where he first lived upon arrival to this country. What I haven't spoken about is the difficult circumstances that followed shortly after he arrived here in Scotland, in a country where he could barely speak the language and he had little to his name. Unfortunately, five years after arriving in Scotland, my grandmother, Muhammad Yusuf's wife, died at the age of 33, leaving my grandfather having to raise five children. He got remarried, but was left with five devastated ch children, including my father uh, and my uncle, one of his children, still a young baby. My grandfather went on to become a successful small business owner. And although he has now passed away, his wife, my, my step-grand, still to this day works in the convenience store uh, in Mayfield. She tell me, tells me Daniel Johnson is one to pop in on occasion. I mention his story, presiding officer, because there's no way that my grandfather, all those decades ago, could have supported his five children and have been a successful small business owner if it wasn't for the support of society and of the state. At a time when he really needed it, the government was there to support him financially. That, in turn, helped to unleash his entrepreneurial spirit. And over the decades, he created jobs and contributed significantly to society, not least through the taxes that he paid. There's no doubt in my mind that economic growth goes hand in hand with tackling poverty as it did for my grandfather all those years ago. Mm -hmm. The programme for government I'm publishing today is unashamedly anti-poverty and pro-growth. And it has a focus on supporting women who are disproportionately affected by the pressures of modern life, including uh, through expanding our childcare offer. Presiding officer, when I became First Minister, I promised I would lead a government for the whole country. In this chamber, we must never forget that while we disagree sometimes, and quite rightly passionately, there is far more that unites us than divides us. Over the last two years, the SNP and Scottish Green parties have successfully worked together to build a greener, fairer Scotland. In a world full of uncertainty, people rightly expect their elected representatives to work together constructively. And that is exactly what we have done. So to all the parties represented in this chamber, I repeat the offer I made upon becoming First Minister. You will sometimes disagree with things we do. But when you can, work with us. You will find that my door is always open. I've already shown my willingness to work with others in recent months. But we should also remember the words of the late David McClechey. He warned about worshipping the false god of consensus. In that vein, the government I lead will not simply coalesce around the lowest common denominator. For the good of society, for our future, for our children, where we need to, we will pick a side. And in particular, while other political parties are abdicating their responsibilities to tackle the climate emergency, we will be unapologetic in taking the action needed to ensure a sustainable future for our children and for our planet. Presiding officer, this programme is an opportunity to be explicit about the driving mission of this government. So let me make it abundantly clear. We are a government who will maximise every single lever at our disposal to tackle the scourge of poverty in our country. We have adopted progressive tax and spending policies to face those challenges. I will never shy away from the belief that those who earn the most should pay the most. But let me be equally clear, without any equivocation, 
we also need to support economic growth. Not for its own sake, but so we can tackle poverty and improve our public services. The unfortunate reality is the Scottish Government is currently operating with one hand tied behind our back. Scotland has had no control over the fallout from the UK Government's disastrous mini-budget, or Brexit, or over a decade of austerity. However, we still have to deal with the devastating consequences of those actions. To give just one example, in the past five years, we have spent more than £700 million in countering the impact of Westminster welfare cuts alone. That's why this government will never stop believing that decisions about Scotland should not be made by a government based in Westminster, but by the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just remind members there should be no interventions or interruptions of any kind during the statement? Independent countries comparable to Scotland are wealthier and fairer than the UK. And with our abundant resources, the question we must ask ourselves is why not Scotland? In proposing the case for independence, we will set out a positive vision for Scotland's future. And there is much to be positive about. Scotland's economy already performs better than most parts of the UK. We have world-class universities and colleges and significant strengths and potential in many of the key economic sectors of the future. Today's programme sets out how we will build on these strengths to make people's lives better. Presiding officer, tackling poverty is deeply personal to me. Growing up in the Islamic faith, one of the core beliefs of our faith and that I was taught is that you're not a true Muslim if you have a full stomach while your neighbour goes to bed hungry. Tackling poverty isn't straightforward, given the restrictions of devolution, especially in the face of a cost of living crisis and challenging budget settlements. But it is absolutely essential. So whether it's faith or your humanism and ingrained sense of social justice, we must all surely unite in saying that in 2023, with the abundance of wealth we have as a society, it is morally indefensible that people in our country, frankly, our planet, go to sleep hungry. So my first announcement today is this, that by February, we will remove income thresholds for our Best Start Foods programme, meaning a further 20,000 pregnant mothers and children will benefit from financial support for milk and healthy food. This is a further demonstration of this government giving our children the best possible start. And we will invest more than £400 million in the Scottish Child Payment to help more than 300,000 children across the country. For many families, the payment worth £25 per child per week ensures food is on the table or the heating is on at home. We can already see the benefits of this policy now but its true legacy will last for a lifetime. Through our actions, through this government's actions, an estimated 90,000 children have been lifted, are estimated to be lifted out of poverty. That is the difference this government is making. The Scottish Child Payment is part of a total investment of more than five billion pounds in Scottish government social security payments which supports more than 1.2 million people the length and breadth of Scotland. I can confirm that funding will increase by almost £1 billion in the year ahead, and we will continue to explore what more can be done to tackle poverty during the budget process. We've also convened an expert group to look at how we can make progress towards a minimum income guarantee, and today I'm calling on the UK government to use their reserve powers to establish an essentials guarantee, to ensure the value of universal credit payments is always sufficient for people to afford essential items such as food, transport and energy. In addition to these actions, we will continue to reduce some of the costs that affect households right across the country. Presiding officer, this government has led the way in the provision of universal free school meals for primary school children. I can confirm that working with councils, we will roll out universal free school meals for all pupils in primary six and seven, starting with those children in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment. 
From October, we're introducing a pilot project to remove peak fares on ScotRail services. In addition, we recognise housing costs are a key factor in determining people's standard of living. During the cost of living crisis, this government took prompt action to introduce emergency rent caps for most private tenants and to introduce additional protections against eviction. We've now laid regulations to ensure, to ensure those measures will remain in place until the 31st of March next year. We will also introduce a housing bill to introduce long-term rent controls and new tenants' rights and to establish new duties for the prevention of homelessness. And we will continue to work to reduce the number of people living in temporary accommodation. We will invest £750 million to support the delivery of affordable homes and meet our target of securing 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. 10% of those homes will be located in rural and island communities because we know those communities are facing significant housing challenges. But we also know those communities are not passive. We see in the lights of the Arran Development Trust, the Mullan Iona Community Trust and Staffing Community Trust, real ambition in supporting new housing. So we've been working with local government, business, the third sector, and crucially local communities to publish an action plan for housing in rural and island areas later this year. We've established a 20 to 25 million pound fund to provide homes for key workers in rural areas. Across Scotland, we will invest £60 million this year to acquire empty properties for use as affordable homes. Following consultation, I can confirm we will also enable councils to apply a premium on council tax rates for second homes, a demonstration of our desire to empower local government to tackle the challenges they face. And we will introduce a cladding remediation bill and ask this parliament be given the powers to introduce a levy in Scotland mirroring the UK government's building safety levy for England. Presenting officer, the protection of and where possible the advancement of rights is a collective obligation for each and every single one of us. I've spoken about the racism and Islamophobia that I have and continue to face. Many others in this parliament have spoken about the bigotry, the homophobia, the ableism, the misogyny that they have been on the receiving end of. And as part of our mission to promote equality and eradicate hatred, we will improve human rights protections through a human rights bill. There are those in this parliament who have said recently, we concentrate far too much on social policy. But, presiding officer, it is our job, every MSP's job, to help protect marginalised communities from the hatred that is far too pervasive in our society. And a population that has its rights protected is one that can thri thrive. It's not just good for society, that it is, but it's also good for our economy too. Finally, on the theme of equality, we recognise, recognise that helping people into good, fairly paid work is also a key part of tackling poverty. We will work with local authorities and employers to help people who face barriers to, to starting or restarting work. And we will support care leavers into employment. This is just one of the ways in which we will help to keep our promise to those with experience of care. I will also, also personally convene a dedicated cabinet subcommittee for the promise. We will not let those with care experience down. Presiding officer, this government also recognises the crucial role of childcare in helping parents to return to work, benefiting not just them, but the wider economy. The Scottish Government has expanded ELC to 1140 hours a year for all three and four year olds and around a quarter of all two year olds. I am pleased to announce we will go further. Firstly, we will provide funding in six early adopter council areas to increase access to childcare from nine months old through to the end of primary school. Secondly, we will accelerate the next phase in our expansion of childcare for families with two-year-olds at reaching thousands more families. Thirdly, we will give parents and carers more scope to manage their childcare so it meets their specific needs. Some parents may want to use a mix of provision and may find arranging and keeping track of their childcare stressful. So we'll simplify that process 
enabling parents through digital means to have more control over their childcare choices. Fourth, we will support efforts to recruit and retain more childminders with an aim to recruit a thousand more childminders by the end of this parliament. And fifth, we know one of the biggest challenges the sector faces is recruitment. So I can confirm today we will provide funding so staff in the private, voluntary and independent sector who deliver funded early learning and childcare are paid a minimum of £12 an hour from April of next year. High quality, early education and childcare is a perfect example of a policy that is both anti-poverty and pro-growth. And I'm proud that Scotland has the most generous childcare offer in the UK and I'm committed to ensuring we stay ahead and provide families with the crucial support that they need. Presenting officer, one of my earliest actions as First Minister was to develop a new and stronger relationship with business so we can work together to create jobs and create opportunities. In the year ahead, we will implement the recommendations made by the New Deal for Business Group. Where we can, we will also work with the UK government to support growth. In fact, I wrote to the UK government just yesterday to request discussions on this very issue. One idea I'm keen to explore with them is a recommendation in the recent report from the Hunter Foundation about using tax incentives and wider economic policy to support investment in key sectors such as renewables. Scotland has long been a nation of innovation and invention, but for all the excellent success that we have had, we also have to be honest, we haven't always managed to retain that entrepreneurial talent and the jobs that they, that they create here in Scotland. So this programme for government sets out a £15 million plan to support innovation and entrepreneurship. It includes increased support for Scottish EDGE and the, Scot the Scottish Ecosystem Fund, continued work to implement Mark Logan's excellent review of our technology ecosystems, a blueprint to make our colleges and universities stronger bases for entrepreneurs, and a programme to deliver the recommendations of Anna Stewart's equally excellent report on supporting women into enterprise. We will also work to continue to attract international investment and promote exports. And we will support small businesses. For example, we will work with local government and our enterprise agencies to transform the support we provide them. We'll work with business organisations to help small businesses improve their productivity. And we will build on the work of the New Deal for Business Group, for example, in considering improvements to the non-domestic rates system. These early actions demonstrate our determina determination to listen and to act as we build a new relationship with business to support economic growth for a purpose. In the year ahead, we'll continue investment in important infrastructure, including, of course, to continued investment in the construction of six new ferries by 2026. And alongside our record investment in active travel, will reopen the Leavenmouth rail line, electrify the Glasgow to Bar headline, and open a new rail station at East Linton. We are, of course, committed to improving the A96, including dueling the road from Inverness to Nairn with a Nairn bypass. And let me be crystal clear, uh, presiding officer, this government, my government, will duel the A9 from Inverness to Perth. And I can confirm today, Thank we you. have launched the procurement for the Tomatin to Moy section as the next step in that work. Presenting officer, we are also helping the rural economy. In the coming year, we will help to create a new framework for rural support through the Agriculture Bill. We'll promote our food and drink industry. We'll press the UK government to honour its obligations to our fishing sector. When it comes to Scotland's land, it is clear that our land reform bill will make land ownership more transparent and will also give communities more opportunities to own their land. We will step up to the challenge, we'll seek to be bold and radical, and we'll continue to develop proposals for crofting law reform. And we'll continue to support Scotland's thriving tourism sector and to promote major events. And we will publish further details of our future support for culture in the forthcoming budget. This sector should be assured that this government values the role of culture, not just for the substantial economic impact it has, but also for the incredible joy that it brings people in Scotland and right around the world. The final part of our economic plans I want to talk about 
is also one of the most important. You only, planning officer, need to look at the United States or the European Union to see the way in which ambitious government and state support for green industries is helping to create new jobs. The inactivity of the UK government risks us falling behind in an increasingly competitive race. So the Scottish Government is taking action to boost green industries with the limited powers that we do have. One important area where I can announce change is through the consenting processes for renewable technologies. We will agree a sector deal with the onshore wind industry to half the consenting time for new Section 36 wind farms. And as part of this deal, we will maximise the benefits onshore wind can create for local communities and for Scotland's economy. We'll also streamline offshore wind consenting processes and continue to implement our hydrogen action plan. But I continue to appeal to the UK government, which holds these substantial levers over tax and financial incentives, to use these powers to unleash and accelerate the renewables potential of our country. Our economy, indeed our planet, deserves better than Westminster inertia. We will also take forward our work on a green industrial strategy. We'll consult on, heat in buildings, uh, on a heat in buildings bill, and we'll continue to promote a circular economy. We'll publish our final energy strategy and just transition plan, and we'll continue to protect and enhance our natural environment. And crucially, we'll continue to show global leadership in inter international climate discussions. Presiding officer, as well as the enormous economic opportunity created by climate action, there's an overwhelming moral imperative. The terrifying impacts of climate change are not something to worry about in the distant future. They are here today. Yeah. In that context, some of the actions of the Westminster parties over this summer, such as the UK government's reluctance to support onshore wind, its commitment to more than 100 new oil and gas licenses, Labour's U-turning, on low emission zones, they are baffling as they are dangerous. Yeah. The Scottish Government will take a responsible approach and show climate leadership. Tackling the climate crisis will be hard, but in the long run, doing nothing, or even worse, acting far too slowly, is the more expensive choice. It's a choice that will see far more lives lost on our planet. It's a choice for which we would rightly never be forgiven by our children yeah or our grandchildren. Presiding officer, this programme also sets out how we will support strong and high quality public services. The National Health Service is already making progress in recovering from the pandemic. We have the best performing accident and emergency departments in the UK, and in the last year, the number of people waiting more than 18 months for treatment has almost halved. We'll work with health boards to reduce waiting lists further in the year ahead. A fourth national treatment centre will open in Forth Valley in the coming year, and the centre at the Golden, Golden Jubilee Hospital will increase our capacity. And we will continue to work with local authorities on the introduction of the National Care Service. Presiding officer, during the summer, I spent a considerable amount of time hearing directly from people from all walks of life, right across the country, about the challenges they are struggling with. One group who are inspirational is the Purple Poncho Players, a theatrical group made up of disabled people who put on gripping performances which challenge governments and all of us in society to confront the uncomfortable truth of life as a disabled person in Scotland. I heard very moving testimony from them, uh, the Glasgow Disability Alliance and others who have been affected by the closure of the Independent Living Fund, which assists disabled people with especially complex needs to get the support they need in order to live independent lives. I'm therefore pleased to announce today that I will, I will reopen the Independent Living Fund in the next financial year with an initial investment of up to nine million pounds. In the year ahead, we will also improve access to GP services and we will launch the National Centre for Remote and Rural Health and Care. We'll also publish a new delivery plan for mental health and wellbeing. We'll continue with our mission to reduce drugs deaths and we'll invest in alcohol and drugs partnerships. Recent drug deaths figures show we're heading in the right direction, but no more than that. The scale of the challenge in front of us 
requ requires us to take, to take radical approaches. There must, th these approaches must be grounded in the evidence of what works. And that is why we will support a proposal to establish a safer drug consumption facility and argue for drug law reform. In light of the latest Home Office Select Committee report, I would urge the UK government to listen to the evidence mm -hmm. and either support a safer drug consumption facility or at least devolve the power to us so we can more easily take that bold action that is required. Yeah. We're also reviewing the responses to the alcohol marketing consultation. We will always support jobs and the economy. We'll also work with industry where appropriate, but be in no doubt, we will take further action to reduce alcohol harm and particularly to protect children from its ill effects. Talking of children, presiding officer, I hear too often about how common vaping is amongst our young people. In the next year, we will take action to reduce vaping and particularly amongst children. I'm pleased to announce this government will also consult on curbing the sale of disposable single-use vapes, including consulting on an outright ban. Presiding officer, this government also recognises the vital importance of supporting our health and care workforce. Scotland is and remains the only part of the UK where there has been no industrial action in the health service. That's because we never question the motivations of our workforce in seeking higher pay in the midst of a cost of living crisis. And we were prepared to face up to some very challenging negotiations. We worked with unions. We agreed deals which benefit patients and staff. And as a result, we've ensured NHS Scotland staff remain the best paid anywhere in the UK. And I'm pleased to confirm that today I will fulfil a promise I made to social care staff before becoming First Minister. We will provide funding to enable an increase of pay of social care workers in direct care roles so that they can be paid at least £12 an hour. For those on full-time contracts, this could lead to a pay increase from April of up to £2,000 a year. This increase of over 10% values our social care staff, helps them to support their families and also helps us to recruit and to retain staff. It is good for individual employees, for our social care services and for our society as a whole. Presiding officer, another issue that is close to my heart as First Minister and as a husband and as a father is the issue of miscarriage. I've spoken before about the personal loss and trauma that my wife Nadia and I have faced through multiple miscarriages. It's a health issue that society is now more open about, but I think it's still less talked about than perhaps maybe it should be. I know how that sense of loss, regardless of when it happens during a pregnancy, is certainly one that stays with you for life. Each loss Nadia and I have suffered has been difficult. There's no doubt in my mind that we can better support those who experience miscarriage. The programme for government today outlines how we will continue to improve care and support for miscarriage, including ensuring women don't have to wait until a third miscarriage to receive tailored support. Uh, the, we also will help to provide access to progesterone prescriptions and secure separate spaces in hospital, hospitals within maternity wards for women who suffer a miscarriage. I'm also pleased to say that later this month, we will launch a certificate memorial book of pregnancy and baby loss prior to 24 weeks. And I want to thank and pay tribute to my predecessor for the work that she has done on that particular issue. Presiding officer, this government will also continue to support our schools and promote excellence in education. We'll introduce an education bill to establish a new qualifications body in Scotland and to create an independent education inspectorate. We'll set out plans for reforming our education and skills bodies and we'll deliver the pay deal we've reached with our teachers. We'll continue our work to widen access to university. This work is now seeing record numbers of students from disadvantaged backgrounds, around 5,600 in the latest official statistics, enter our universities. We'll also rejoin key international education studies and we'll continue to focus on closing the attainment gap and improve outcomes for young people with additional support needs. We'll also continue to support equality and diversity in schools, for example, through our anti-racism and education programme and, uh, and through promoting a decolonised curriculum. And we'll invest in our police, fire and just, uh, justice services too. The introduction of body-worn cameras is a priority for the police and for this government. So we'll start introducing that technology 
next year. And we've already reduced the backlog of cases in our justice system by over a third and will aim to end the backlog in summary cases during 2024. And we'll, we will invest in our prisons while also working with community justice partners to reduce reoffending and create safer communities. We will focus, continue to focus on ensuring victims and witnesses of crime are at the very heart of our justice system. Presiding officer, we live in times when the rights of women in many parts of the world are regressing. It is important that governments who believe passionately in taking a stand against misogyny, including state and institutional misogyny, stand up and be counted. That is why we will work with Gillian Mackay to support her bill for safe access for abortion. It simply cannot be right that women feel in any way impeded in accessing healthcare. And we will bring forward legislation to criminalise misogynistic abuse, following the, pu the public consultation and Baroness Kennedy's report into the issue. Presenting officer, just before uh, I close, I want to expand on that point. The Me Too movement, the Reclaim the Night marches, and the response to the murders of Sarah Everard and Sabina Anessa have instigated a movement of women sharing their stories about everyday sexism, about harassment, about the tragic and violent crime women <coughs> are too often subjected to. The steps the Scottish Government is taking to criminalise misogynistic abuse and improve, in our, uh, improve our criminal justice system, they're, they're in part a response to that, but they cannot be the only response. There's a much bigger responsibility on our society as a whole, and particularly on all men, to create a positive change. Men, all of us, myself of course included, need to do more than simply call out negative male behaviour. We need to tackle what is often called toxic masculinity, which harms men and boys, as well as, of course, women and girls. We must build a society where men feel confident in taking a stand against misogyny. But to do so, we must also promote the positive and highlight to boys and men the benefits that positive masculinity can provide for their everyday lives, how it can build respectful, healthier relationships with their partners, with their families, with colleagues, with society, and also lead to better mental health and well-being for men and boys. The Scottish Government doesn't have all the answers on this. I, 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 we cannot take, it cannot take it on alone. But it is a challenge we will return to, and as First Minister, I'm committed to leading on this issue in my own actions and those of the, gov of the government that I lead. Presenting officer, in conclusion, at the start of this statement, I made it clear the Scottish Government will always be on the side of the people we serve. Scotland is, certainly should be, a land of opportunity. But I know it doesn't always feel like that. To people bearing the brunt of a Westminster cost of living crisis, to families living in poverty, to struggling businesses, to those who still face consequences of discrimination and inequality. I get that. That's why this programme for government tackles poverty and inequality head on. As part of our work to create opportunities and build strong communities. In the year ahead, we will help more than 300,000 children with more than £1,000 a year through the Scottish Child Payment. We'll increase social security spending by almost a billion pounds. We'll expand free school meals. We'll widen access to financial advice. We'll help more parents buy healthy food. We'll help disabled people with the most complex needs so they can live independent lives. We'll safeguard the rights of tenants. We'll promote payment of the living wage. We'll increase the pay of childcare and social care staff, and we will expand high quality childcare. We will do all of this first and foremost because it is the right thing to do. But also, as I know from my own family history, because providing people with support and security helps them to contribute to society and create opportunities for others. This programme for government sets out how we will work with partners to tackle, pov to tackle poverty, to promote growth, to strengthen the public services we all depend on. The people in Scotland, people of Scotland, should be left in absolutely no doubt whatsoever. This Scottish Government is on their side. This programme for government shows how we will make progress towards a fairer, wealthier and greener Scotland. And I am delighted, Presiding Officer, to commend it to this Parliament. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's statement.
The next item of business is a debate on programme for government 2023 to 2024. I'd be grateful if members who wish to contribute were to press their request to speak buttons. And I now call on Douglas Ross. Thank you uh, very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, could I begin, as we all come back to Parliament, to welcome colleagues, of course, but to say how good it is to see the BBC Scotland's political editor, Glenn Campbell, in the press gallery. <laughs> Glenn is a formidable interviewer, but he is rightly respected by his colleagues and those he reports on. Uh, and I know I speak for every MSP from every party in wishing him and his family well in the journey ahead. Presiding officer, last week I called on the First Minister to rise to the big challenges that Scotland is facing today. To ditch the uh, discredited uh, agenda of his predecessor and to be his own man. Yet what we've heard today is very much the same as before. Far from the bold programme for Scotland that we were promised, we're getting the same tinkering around the edges on our public services. Consultations and trials rather than promises and delivery. Extreme green policies that will devastate our economy and rural communities. And of course, very predictably, the overwhelming focus on the SNP's obsession with independence. In this statement, we've just heard from the First Minister, and they're laughing, independence got a mention before education, yep. before the NHS, before the economy. Hamza Youssef's already told us it's going to be line one, page one of the SNP manifesto, yep. and it's right up there at the front of the programme for government. It could be so much better than this. With a £60 billion budget, the support of thousands of civil servants, this is the best that Nicola Sturgeon's prodigy can do. Where's the urgency, the ambition, the action? After 16 years of SNP government, our children get a worse education than we did. When they leave school, they will have reduced access to higher education and fewer good job opportunities. And when they grow old, they'll be waiting longer for life-saving ambulances or on an NHS waiting list for essential treatment. Yep. This reheated uh, programme for government and the proposals within it show that Hamza Yusuf's government have done nothing to reverse the decline that we have seen over 16 years of an SNP government. When Scotland needed a national government, we've once again been given a nationalist government. Instead of speaking to Scotland, Hamza Yusuf would rather be marching alongside flag-waving independence diehards like he was at the weekend. He would rather be campaigning, as he himself did, the self-titled first activist, than governing as first minister. And this programme reflects that. But turning to the detail that we've just heard this afternoon, there are some slim positives we'd like to focus on. We welcome, we welcome the commitment to finally tackle unsafe cladding. My colleagues Graham Simpson and Miles Briggs have been campaigning for action on this for many, many months. And it's right that action will now be taken to mirror the legislation that was introduced by Michael Gove in the UK government back in March. Before this next one, I'd like to remind the Chamber of my register of interest as the husband of a practicing police officer. So we also welcome the pay deal that's been reached with the police and that body-borne cameras will be introduced. In addition, on this side of the chamber, we welcome the commitment to the rollout of childcare from nine months in line with the proposals of the UK government that were announced in the last budget. However, that is where the praise for this programme for government from Hamza Youssef ends. Because much of the programme was committed by his predecessor. Far from relaunching his premiership, this programme digs in deeper into the mud of Nicola Sturgeon's policy failures. We were promised that this would be a plan of Hamza Yusuf's first real opportunity to show what his own priorities are. Yep. Yet after half a year in office, he has literally just continued where we've been before. Instead, it's business as usual from this continuity government and continuity first minister. It's also a programme that's a lot of talk and very little action. So let's look at some of the talk eh, that we heard from the first minister. He was patting himself on the back by telling us all that he'd developed a, a new and stronger relationship with business. 
So how has that been judged, First Minister? Well, this week, the Fraser of Allender Institute found that only 9% of Scottish businesses believe that his government understands them. Yep. What a reset. 9% yep. of businesses in Scotland thinks Hamza Youssef and his government yep. understands them. And only 8% think it is listening effectively to their sectors. He's not even listening now, but he's certainly not listening to businesses when 8% in that survey say this government has closed its ears to them. There were no commitments in this programme for government to pass on the business rates relief that we've seen in England and Wales to help struggling, struggling shops, pubs and hotels. And he also spoke about supporting a thriving tourism sector by shutting it down, by shutting it down. Because unlike the majority of the First Minister's colleagues, I was outside listening to bed and breakfast owners this afternoon who are saying that the legislation that's been passed that will come in if there is no further delay on the 1st of October is going to close them down. Yep. The short-term let's legislation is going to wreak havoc in the tourism industry across Scotland. And the deaf ears on the government benches is going to see these businesses closed. And I think the First Minister should be ashamed and accept he has got this wrong again. Yep. It was right there was a pause for six months to look at how the legislation could be improved. His government did nothing in that time. And if he will not come forward in the next week to accept the failures of this legislation yep. and announce a further pause, then the Scottish Conservatives will force a vote on that issue next week. Because we need to listen to these businesses who are going to stop, who are going to go out of business. We are listening to them on this side. He is ignoring them. Let's ensure that their voice is heard in this parliament. And I hope that colleagues on the government benches will also listen to their constituents. Now, just last week, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives published our own bold and ambitious plan to grow Scotland's economy, to make Scotland more competitive within the United Kingdom, deliver a national workforce plan and tackle regional imbalances through innovation and entrepreneurship. I would gladly give way to Mr Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Um, Mr Ross talks about a bold economic plan published by the Conservatives, but that plan does not include dealing with Brexit, which has stymied our economy and destroyed many people's lives. What does he have to say about that? Douglas Ross. I made it very clear when I announced this plan last week that we are looking not just for the coming months, the coming years, but the coming decades, because we know there are very scary warnings about the future of Scotland's economy, not from uh, opposition parties, but from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, who said in the next 50 years, yep. Scotland, to just get the services we have at the moment, won't have the income to deliver that. So we are looking into the future. Kevin Stewart and others can look into the past, but we need to be far more positive. We need to ensure that we grow Scotland's economy. And from high tax hums in the SNP, we'll never get that with this current SNP government. Because there were opportunities last week, and there are still opportunities now, for the First Minister to take on board the practical recommendations to show that jobs and businesses really are his priority. Yet, the First Minister continues to be led by the extremist Greens who don't believe in a wealthier Scotland. Here, here. They want to shut down our North Sea oil and gas sector as soon as possible, despite the sector supporting tens of thousands of Scottish jobs and contributing over £9 billion to Scottish public spending. What the SNP and the Greens don't seem to realise is that it would devastate communities across the north of Scotland if we were to withdraw from the North Sea, but it would also remove the biggest source of investment and skills for the development of renewable energy projects in uh, Scotland. The First Minister should abandon his predecessor's position, pull rank on his Green Coalition partners and back Scotland's oil, or else there will not be an SNP MP left in the North East yep. of Scotland after the next election. And I don't hold out much hope for the SNP MPs in that area, because we got one mention, Deputy Presiding Officer, of oil and gas in the First Minister's statement. Yep. Do you know how many mentions of oil and gas there are in the accompanying documents? Zero. Uh. Not one mention of this key sector for the north of Scotland, for the whole of Scotland, for the United Kingdom, in the accompanying documents to this programme for government. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about this First Minister's uh, priorities. 
there was a discussion about infrastructure. So we are in a debate, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm very keen to take an intervention from the First Minister at any point, but particularly now, because he made a very clear commitment that this Scottish Government, his Scottish Government, will fully duel the A9 from Perth to Inverness. So I say to the First Minister, when? Yep. Yep. No, nothing. When? Nothing. Well, I'll give way. Come on. Come on. I mean, this is a serious issue. The First Minister inserts, the First Minister inserts this into his programme for government and claims this is a big announcement, but there's nothing to back it up. This is a crucial infrastructure project no that is absolutely vital for Perthshire and the Highlands of Scotland, indeed for connectivity across our country. We had the highest death rate in that, on that road last year in 20 years, and the First Minister can't say when his promise will be delivered. Uh, he mentions the A96, and we've gone from the SNP saying they would fully duel the A96 to say there will be improvements. Now, I welcome the Nairn bypass and the improvements from Inverness to Nairn that's been mentioned, but the A96 goes from Inverness to Aberdeen. Yep. What about the rest of that route? Previously promised to be fully duelled, now we're only going to get uh, improvements along the way. Nothing in the programme for government about a long-term solution of, for the landslides on the A83. And we heard that there's going to be six new ferries delivered in the next couple of years. Well, the current couple are already six years late, so I don't hold out much hope for that either. Uh, in the time remaining, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to look at some of the other issues. It just got a fleeting mention from the First Minister. First of all, the NHS. He's promised that he's going to make it easier and it will be more accessible for patients to see their GPs. The first thing that would be quite good is if his health secretary, who I don't think is in the chamber today, would actually meet with GP. Sorry, sorry. I, I missed Mr. Matheson there. I, I mentioned... I, I, I mentioned Mr. Matheson... I mentioned... I mentioned Mr. Matheson... I mentioned Mr. Matheson because he has refused to meet with GP campaigners in my local area. I've written to him several times. They got in touch with me again to say they'd had a disappointing letter back from Mr. Matheson. We've got campaigners trying to keep surgeries open in Burghead and Hopeman. He's not willing to meet with them either. And I thought it was quite interesting that the First Minister mentioned the NHS today and what he's doing to improve the NHS on the day that it was confirmed there are now 820,000 Scots on an NHS waiting list. A new record, 820,000. Now, back in March, when that number had dropped, the First Minister said it was heartening that this waiting list was going down. It's now increased by 51,000. So I'll give way this time to the First Minister if you'll tell us what his response is to waiting number of Scots on a waiting list, 820,000, up 51,000 at their record level. Is that heartening? I'm happy to. First Minister. Happy, thank you for the uh, invitation to contribute. Uh, what I would say to Douglas Ross is, of course, for every single person that is waiting too long, we don't want them to wait so long. That is why, of course, increasing wages for social care workers is so important to help with the recovery of our NHS. What doesn't, of course, and what would never have helped our NHS in terms of its waiting list, in terms of waiting times, is if we had industrial action like, of course, other parts of the UK have seen, yeah. especially where the Conservatives are in charge. And I hope Douglas Ross, with any marginal influence you'll have, will ask Steve Barclay to take up Michael Matheson's offer so that we can mediate and ensure that junior doctors in England get paid fairly, just as they are here in Scotland. Douglas Ross, I can give you the time back. I can't believe they're actually applauding that. There you have it. The response to NHS waiting lists in Scotland being at their record level, up 51,820,000 Scots on a waiting list in Scotland. And that is the dismal response you get from Scotland's First Minister. I will rush through the last couple of things I wanted to mention. The First Minister puts in his uh, statement that he is willing to work with other parties. Then please, work with me work with Scottish Conservatives, Scottish uh, Labour supporters, Scottish Liberal Democrats and I know SNP supporters who back the Right to Recovery Bill. Yes, we saw a reduction in the number of deaths in 2022, but we are still the worst in the United Kingdom uh, and by a large margin the worst in Europe. Yeah. In, his statement, in his statement, the First Minister endorsed the bill of Gillian Mackay. He could do the same right now and say he is backing the Right to Recovery Bill. Backing it 100% and SNP members will vote for it.
First Minister, Douglas Ross for, for, for giving way. Uh, first and foremost, I haven't seen the detail of the bill. If Douglas, Ross, if Douglas Ross has published it, then I'm more than happy to see the detail. When I met with Douglas Ross ahead of summer, he said it would be published by summer recess. It's not been published. He's obviously uh, still working on the detail. And what I would say to Douglas Ross, on that point of influence, if he can please ensure that the UK government take an evidence-based approach and where they're not willing to be radical and bold, at least devolve the powers to us so we can take forward safer drug consumption facilities. It's very clear the First Minister in his programme for government statement could back Julie Mackay's bill, which is not as at an advanced stage as my current bill is, so he could surely do the same for Right to Recovery. The last two issues I want to speak about is an agriculture bill. Speaking about the meeting that we had back in the summer, Hamza Yusuf promised me that there was going to be an agricultural bill coming to this parliament before the Highland Show. He was telling me this was a big show in Edinburgh that lasts a couple of days. I know it actually lasts four days and I've been to it every year. But the point is, the agriculture bill was promised before the summer recess. We've still heard no more about it. It's going to be another year. Farmers and crofters are crying out for it. And I know Rachel Hamilton's going to say more about that uh, in her speech later on. Finally, uh, Hamza Youssef uh, mentioned support for the police. And I've already recognised the welcome already welcomed uh, the pay deal that has been reached today. But the comments about the police come from Hamza Youssef, someone who wanted the police to investigate a hoax video, but now doesn't seem to want them to investigate real crimes. That's what we heard in the northeast of Scotland yesterday. This is the direction of travel from this SNP government uh, and justice under them. Presiding officer, today's statement could have delivered so much for Scotland. It had the opportunity to reset the agenda with business, with the economy, on our NHS and education. In all areas, it has failed. It is continuity from a continuity First Minister. It should be and could be so much better. And over the coming year, the Scottish Conservatives will scrutinise what comes forward and will come up and offer the real alternatives to focus on the real priorities of people across Scotland. Thank you, Mr Ross. I now call Anna Sarwa for around 11 minutes. Mr Sarwa. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start with the point of consensus and echo the comments of Douglas Ross uh, in relation to Glenn Campbell. It's fantastic to see him uh, back on his feet and we wish him and all his family all of the best. Uh, and now there are undoubtedly some things that we would welcome and support in today's programme for government. The acceptance of Scottish Labour's long-standing campaign to increase pay for social care staff to £12 is welcome. We would like to see the pathway to the fight for 15. We, of course, support the proposals on empty homes and second homes, even though we believe that could go further and be stronger. And we, of course, support the commitment to criminalise misogyny, as well as support those the proposal he set out to impose, uh, support those impacted by uh, miscarriage. Uh, we also support the intention to improve partnership with business uh, and work on an industrial strategy, but this must be more than rhetoric. Uh, business will judge the government on delivery, not on bland uh, promises. But, Deputy President Officer, the First Minister can't hide from reality. This is an SNP government that has lost its way, that has no clear direction, no sense of purpose and no central mission. And they also can't escape from the fact that they are trying to clear a mess of their own making. 16 years of incompetence and financial mismanagement. Because the truth is, Scotland needed a programme for government to match the scale of the twin crises hitting Scots. A cost of living crisis and an NHS crisis. It took the First Minister 22 minutes to even mention our National Health Service. Because this package today isn't good enough, it isn't bold enough, and it won't do enough to confront those challenges. Yeah, yeah. Families needed a government that was relentlessly focused on reducing the burdens on their household incomes in the middle of a cost of living crisis. But instead, they get a government that will hit them with council tax and income tax rises. Scots also needed a clear plan to bring down waiting times and reduce waiting lists to confront the NHS crisis. Instead, too many of them are left waiting in pain or being pushed further into debt by being forced to go private. We needed a new vision and a meaningful strategy to fix the long underlying failure which has only made responding to these twin crises harder, a plan to grow Scotland's economy. But instead, what have we seen over the summer? Over the summer, you've seen a government lurch from one scandal to the next, whether it's uncertainty on the party's finances, indulgent spending on credit cards at the taxpayers' expense, or division on the backbenches from those inside the SNP who are clearly uncomfortable with the direction of travel, or consent, perhaps, that there's no direction at all from this First Minister and this SNP government. And the First Minister himself admitted 
that today was a bit of a relaunch and that things had to go well. But I've lost count of the number of false starts and rebrands the First Minister has attempted in the last six months. Yeah, yeah. Because when it, comes, when it comes to the substance, as we've seen today, there may be an attempt to change the headline, but it can't hide a more difficult truth. The First Minister was a continuity candidate who is now left painting the windows on a government responsible for 16 years of failure. First Minister. And Asawa calls me the continuity candidate. It would be helpful if he could hold on to one principle without you turning over the course of a summer, <laughs> presiding officer. We saw a summer of U-turns from Labour. Anna Sawa now supporting the two-child limit, the bedroom tax, the rape clause. Isn't the truth that the people of Scotland and the SNP have an anti-poverty, pro-growth government, whereas what they have with Scottish Labour is simply a party that will do what head office tells them to do. And if so, I can give you the time I'm, back. I'm actually, I'm actually really pleased. I'm actually really pleased the First Minister made that intervention because he would rather attack a party that's not been in government rather than look at his record in government. One in four children in poverty on the SNP's watch. Just last week, just last week, record levels of homelessness applications, record levels of children in temporary accommodation. Silence on the SNP backbenches now when it comes to looking at their own record in government. So enough of the spin, enough of the cheap headlines, enough of blaming somebody else, and instead focus on your failure as a government. And again, they can laugh if they like. The Scottish people are going to get their chance to make their judgment on this SNP government, and I can't wait for them to make that judgment, as will happen, as will happen in Rutherglen and Hamilton West uh, really soon. But, presiding officer, in the last 12 months, uh, so instead of a reset, today's statement reveals a tired government, out of energy, without focus, and now too distracted by internal squabbling to manage more than a tinkering around the edges. Presiding officer, in the last 12 months, there has been a, a lot of superficial change at the top of the Scottish Government, but while the ferry master might have changed, the boat still isn't seaworthy. It is just another tired and rehashed programme from a party that has clearly run out of ideas. And nowhere is that clearer than our National Health Service. A former Health Secretary waiting 22 minutes to talk about our National Health Service. Because across Scotland, 820,000 people are languishing on NHS waiting lists. We are now two years on from when the then Health Secretary, Hamza Yusuf, published his NHS recovery plan. It promised to end long waits, grow the economy, create more capacity, but the experience for patients and staff has been the opposite. One in seven Scots on an NHS waiting list. Over 5,600 nursing and midwifery vacancies and consultant vacancies up to. This is what we've come to expect from Hamza Youssef and this SNP government. Big announcements to get the headline, but not implement when actually in government. Promises to end delayed discharge back in 2015, never met and now costing the NHS 190 million pounds a year. Commitments to end waits of over a year, lying in tatters, while 77,500 Scots wait more than 12 months for tests, appointments and treatments. And most shockingly of all, cancer treatment targets missed repeatedly since 2012. The failure to restore our NHS, to be frank, presiding officer, is a shameful failure. A catch-up plan should mean waiting lists coming down, not going up. The Scottish Labour have repeatedly called for a real NHS recovery, one that ends the cuts to primary care and prioritises mental health support that is being made available in every GP practice and surgery. One that delivers a proper catch-up in cancer with a focus on faster diagnosis and an end to long waits for treatment. A recovery that prioritises community care and paying social care staff properly because that's how we will end delay discharge and improve hospital capacity. And a real workforce plan that actually retains the skills and knowledge of experienced staff and increases the number of doctors, nurses and medical professionals in training. We could have seen this in the programme from the First Minister today if he had brought forward a new NHS recovery plan that gets services back on track and actually deals with the backlogs in diagnostics and in care. Instead, we've seen the repeated old promises and announcements that are actually delays of work that was already promised years ago. And precious little to resolve either the waiting list, diagnostic delays and workforce shortages which have left our much-loved NHS on its knees. And just as it was two years ago, this programme for government 
is just more rhetoric without any reality and no plan to reverse the crisis in our NHS. The utter lack of ambition couldn't be clearer in that gap between rhetoric and reality of the SNP's plans, not just on the NHS, but also their plans on economic growth and jobs too. Because, presiding officer, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis. Families across this country are facing far too many hardships. Right now, there are mothers in Scotland who are skipping meals in order to feed their children. That is the heartbreaking reality of, yes, Tory economic incompetence and failure, but of also SNP inaction and incompetence too. The Tories crashed the economy and caused the hikes in interest rates, which are causing so much misery on households here. But the SNP haven't done enough to help in Scotland. And it isn't just Labour saying that. A majority of Scots don't trust the SNP to act in Scotland's interests on the cost of living. Now, Labour asked the Scottish Government to help with the cost of commuting by following examples from elsewhere to cap bus fares and freeze the cost of rail travel. We called for the excess cash reserves of Scottish water to be repurposed as a £100 water bill rebate. And we set out proposals for a mortgage rescue scheme to ensure no one lost their home because of the Tory economic chaos. But each time the SNP ignored our asks, deciding instead to exacerbate the pressures on households by proposing tax hikes. If the First Minister really thinks that someone earning £28,000 in our country is somehow well off and not struggling right now, and so can pay higher taxes, then he is completely and utterly deluded to the reality facing households across the country. This is a First Minister who keeps saying, you've heard already today, Deputy President Officer, that tacking poverty is a central mission of his government. Well, look at his record. One in four children in living in poverty in Scotland. Homelessness applications have skyrocketed to the highest record ever. Over 9,500 children are living in temporary accommodation. Again, the highest number ever. And just today, it was revealed that three members of the Scottish Government's Poverty and Inequality Commission have resigned to hardly a glowing advert for the First Minister and his announcements today. Because, presiding officer, the SNP has lost its way. In 16 years, they have squandered the legacy of the last Labour government, which lifted one million children out of poverty. They can laugh at lifting a million children out of poverty if they like. Both of Scotland's governments are distracted, divided and failing to deliver. Only Scottish Labour offers a fresh start and real solutions, as well as our proposals to help households with the cost of living. Labour has a plan to cut bills by up to £1,400, invest in Scotland's U and the UK's renewable potential, deliver energy security, clean power and a publicly owned energy company headquartered here in Scotland, whilst also insulating 1.4 million homes. Making the most of these will require a partnership between industry and government so we can build a thriving economy. But today we've had a speech laden with rhetoric that is light on practical delivery. Deputy Presiding Officer, we've had a Scottish Parliament now for 24 years. And I think it's right that many have viewed our Parliament as a social policy Parliament. But it also hasn't been strong enough on economic policy. And that has left Scottish workers being let down, workers facing the pinch, and weakening the potential of our growth. And that's why we have got to put economic strategy, economic growth, as well as social policy at the heart of this parliament if we are going to confront both the cost of living crisis and the cost of doing business crisis as well. Now, we heard about the reset of the business. In the last year, the ministers have shelved several plans which businesses have said are damaging for the economy. HPMAs, abandoned advertising of Scotland's breweries and distilleries, and of course, the wasted money on the deposit return scheme. The question is, how many ideas does the First Minister think will end up on the same scrap here, costing the taxpayers millions from his announcements today? And that's why we stand ready to put economic growth at the heart of our politics again. We stand ready to deliver a model industrial strategy that will get people around the table and remove barriers to investment. We stand ready to deliver a green prosperity plan that will put investment at the heart of delivering clean energy superpower. And we stand ready to make sure every part of our community benefits from the benefits of a Labour government across our country. And every community across our country deserves better. They've been let down far too long right now by two failing governments, a morally bankrupt Tory government and a financially illiterate and incompetent SNP government. We deserve better than both of them. We deserve better than the cruel and out-of-touch Tories, and we deserve better than a divided and distracted SNP. 
Scottish Labour now offers that alternative. Yeah. Only Labour can boot the Tories out of number 10. Only Labour can bring our country together and bring about change for people across our country. Only Labour can tackle the cost of living crisis and save our NHS. Only Labour believes our country's best days lie ahead. It's clear the public believe it's time for change. We're ready to deliver the change Scotland needs. Thank you. I now call Alex Cole Hamilton around eight minutes. Mr Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure to respond to the First Minister on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. But before I do, can I uh, offer our best wishes to Glenn Campbell uh, and the warmth that he has received from the Chamber is testament to the man that he is. Uh, Presiding Officer, I will come on to the detail of what we've heard from the First Minister this afternoon, but I want to start on a priority we heard nothing about, and it is one that I think we will, uh, will dominate our considerations around the public sector uh, estate for some kind of time to come. You'll remember that during the last uh, FMQs before recess, I warned the First Minister about the risks posed by reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, a material that was used in public sector construction for decades. We know that roofs, walls and flooring made of that material risk, and I quote, the catastrophic structural failure which could occur suddenly and without warning. Scottish Liberal Democrat research revealed that it was present in at least uh, four health boards and 37 schools across Scotland. During the summer months, when schools were closed, there was a golden opportunity to get on top of this. But those precious weeks were lost, and now our children are back in class. There is still no central register of affected buildings, no strategy for the swift wholesale replacement of this material, and no national fund for making it safe. Now, parents are sending their children to school anxious that they might be in an unsafe building. Patients are receiving treatment unclear about what is holding up the roof above their heads. I am not trying to frighten people, but we have to take this seriously and recognise the urgency of this situation. We cannot wait for tragedy to be the catalyst for meaningful government action. Presiding officer, Many people across Scotland are still struggling to make ends meet. It is baffling then that this SNP Green administration seems determined to make things harder. Even, even as mortgages soar, food prices remain high and volatility continues in the global energy market, this government has decided to hike rail fares. Last year, and to great fanfare, they announced a price freeze, but that lasted six months with tickets now going up once again and set to rise still further. That means hard-working communities. I will give way to John Mason. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. If he's arguing for no fare increase, is he also arguing that the, the workers in the railway should not give any pay increase? Because that's where their money comes from. Alex Cole Hamilton. I think there's a basic rule of economics here that if you make something cheaper, you'll increase demand and fill those carriages. This will pay for uh, meaningful pay increases. I absolutely support the claim of hardworking rail workers. But it means the decisions of this government re mean that hardworking commuters are being clobbered by steep fares, discouraging people from taking greener public transport. My party wanted to see fares cut, new options for flexible season ticketing, and for the government to work with councils to explore new lines. The, new, the Fair Fares Review has now been on the desk of four transport secretaries, four of them. Worse still, our government plans to raise council tax, which could not have come at a worse time. Council tax is utterly regressive. It was based on property values from 1991. Presiding officer, that was 32 years ago. Ordinary people will be hit hard by government plans to hike council tax, and a quarter of Scottish households will be forced to pay more. Far from scrapping council tax, as Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon promised at the start of their reign, Humza Yusuf and his Green Party colleagues are breathing new life into this hated tax. These changes would see bills go up and services still cut, people paying more for less. It won't offset the SNP Green systemic underfunding of local government, which has devastated essential services but punctuated every budget for years. These increases must be abandoned and local government finally, fully, properly funded. Driving down demand for energy use and fossil fuels should also be at the heart of our quest for net zero and tackling the cost of living emergency. After a summer where we have seen fires raging from Greece to Hawaii, no one need remind us of the urgency to avoid global boiling. Presiding officer, 
I now, now turn to the subject of our natural environment as well. I have raised the increasing problem of sewage in our rivers and on our beaches many times in this chamber. I am disappointed to have nothing from the First Minister on this subject in his remarks today. We don't even know the full extent of the problem because only a small fraction of sewage outflows are monitored. We are still massively behind England here. The government must get to grips with monitoring, publish every single sewage dump, set legally binding targets for dumping and accelerate measures to upgrade Scotland's Victorian sewage system. It is time this government cleaned up its act. Presiding officer, 16 years of SNP government has left our public services near breaking point. We have heard a lot about that this afternoon. And nowhere more so is that true than in our National Health Service. It is engulfed by crisis. Just moments ago, we heard from a BMA chief that Scotland no longer has enough doctors to effectively staff our NHS. This is a service on its knees. In the NHS recovery plan, Humza Youssef, when he was health, health secretary, made a personal promise to clear mental health waiting lists. Yet we are nowhere. Figures released today reveal more than two and a half thousand children and adults waiting more than a year for mental health support. More than a year. We need counsellors in our schools mental health first aiders in our workplaces. We need proper 24-7 support and a massive national recruitment programme to train more professionals in talking therapy. The health secretary must tear up his failed recovery plan and start again. This time it must include an NHS staff assembly and a burnout prevention strategy. It must properly recognise dentists and incentivise them to, to take on NHS patients so that everybody can be seen. And it must include provision for all of those battling long COVID. I cannot believe we have yet another programme for government where they have been completely forgotten once again. Last September, almost exactly a year ago, a group of children whose lives have been devastated by this condition visited this parliament at great cost to their own health to meet with the then Health Secretary Humza Yusuf to ask him for his help. He promised them he would do everything he could. And yet a year on, and sitting at the head of this government, the words long COVID have barely left his lips. He has done nothing, and not one mention of it, across 60 pages of policy documents presented alongside his statement this afternoon. I met those children that day as well. I carry their suffering and their stories with me. The government must, without delay, establish long COVID clinics, a proper treatment pathway, whilst ensuring that clinicians are trained to diagnose and treat those affected by this terrible condition. Presiding officer, all of this needs to be underpinned by a thriving economy. Low growth means less money for our public services, and that has been borne out by GDP figures published last week, which may make grim reading for Scotland. In June, we heard the dreadful news that lifeline ferries have been hit by yet another six-month delay, further disrupting local economies and further £20 million in costs. And we know how important high-quality, flexible childcare is to hard-working families and to our economy. The First Minister is right that we need to go further, but it's not clear whether the steps he's outlined today will resolve the problems that, of those I told him about at the recent Poverty Summit, people unable to work due to inflexibility in childcare. And in my constituency, in the coming weeks, I will chair a virtual town hall meeting about the problem of the scarcity of wraparound care. I am gratified to hear about the recruitment of more childminders, but I fear it will be a sticking plaster on a gaping wound. Presiding officer, this is a time of great change and great challenge. Across Scotland, old certainties are crumbling and new opportunities emerging. Times like these call for us to work hard, to work together in our communities with creativity, energy and a spirit of reform. Form. Scottish Liberal Democrats are committed to playing our part in creating new hope and leading the way for change in Scotland. It is time for this government to step up and play theirs. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, John Swinney, who will be followed by Rachel Hamilton uh, around six minutes. Mr Swinney. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome this opportunity to speak in support of the government's programme today. The announcements made by the First Minister and the Programme for Government, particularly in relation to early learning and childcare, are, I think, especially welcome and significant. And I'd like to address the importance of those proposals in the efforts of the Scottish Government to grow the Scottish economy. These provisions build on the transformation that has taken place in early learning since this Government came to power in 2007. Back then, 
Three and four-year-olds were entitled to 470 hours of early learning and childcare in a year. The provision was increased to 600 hours in 2014, itself a significant transformation of the provision that was available. But after the reforms in 2021, that now stands at 1140 hours for three and four-year-olds and for eligible two-year-olds. That is a seismic change in the provision of early learning and childcare and one of the most significant public service reforms undertaken by any government in Scotland. It is, it, of course. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Is the member also concerned then that people from the poorest backgrounds and poorest families are struggling most to access their early learning and free childcare? John well, Sweeney. That, that should not be the case. But what I would put, point out to Pam Duncan Glancy is that there's formidably more investment and formidably more provision of early learning and childcare than when any Labour government was in power in Scotland at any stage in the past. So this presiding officer is a shining example of a policy development that improves outcomes across a range of different policy areas by creating the best start for children in Scotland, boosting economic growth and tackling poverty. Firstly, it provides us with the opportunity to ensure that every child in our country is getting the best start in life through access to play-based activity, which develops essential skills, access to nutritious food, which develops the foundations of healthy living, and access to support to address any issues a child faces in their development at the earliest possible stage. Uh, of course. Liam Kerr. Uh, you mentioned uh, food there, and free school meals were promised to be introduced by August 2022. Now, the programme for government seems to suggest that it will be 2026 by the time it's introduced, and even then, only for a partial constituency. Can the member confirm that it will, in fact, be 2026 before we see this policy realised? Well, I'll, 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 I'll maybe come on to talk about some of the financial challenges the government faces in a moment as a consequence of the interventions and the support of people like Liam Kerr to the actions of Liz Truss and her associates. All of these elements are critical to ensuring the best start in life for our children. But the second key policy benefit of ELC expansion has been the positive stimulus to economic growth and opportunity. The expansion itself has created new employment opportunities, but the provision has enabled more parents to consider entering the labour market. At a time when we are still experiencing historically low levels of unemployment, which is welcome, and the labour market is very tight due to the folly of Brexit, which is very unwelcome, it is vital that we take every measure to expand the labour market. And third, the expansion of early learning and childcare is part of a range of policy measures designed to combat child poverty, boosted in recent years by the introduction of the Scottish Child Payment. Unique in the United Kingdom, delivered during a cost of living crisis, the Scottish Child Payment is quite literally saving some of our most vulnerable citizens from destitution in our society today. So I support the efforts of the Government for expanding early learning and childcare and ensuring that major policy development is having a multifaceted impact on a range of policy areas. I encourage the Government, and I welcome what the First Minister had to say on this particular point, to ensure the measures that are taken forward now maximise the flexibility that is available to families to deliver this in a way that suits them, to help stimulate greater economic participation and growth. One of the best projects I've seen of putting those aspirations into practice is the Ms. Miss, Mrs. Project in Mary Hill, in the constituency of my friend Bob Doris, where a women's empowerment organisation creates economic opportunity through childcare provision. It demonstrates how third sector partners can be involved to make this happen, listening carefully to the thoughts and the input of those most affected by these reforms. Now, these proposals, presiding officer, to expand early learning and childcare are taking place at a time of enormous financial strain in the public finances. Reforms of this type have to be paid for. It's worth noting that we're meeting today on the first anniversary of the election of Liz Truss as leader of the Conservative Party. I'm reminded that the Conservatives here demanded that the Scottish Government follow the policy direction advocated by Liz Truss. And look at the damage that has now done. Look now at the perilous position of the public finances. Look now at the very real hardship being faced by people who are wrestling with a massive impact on their lives 
of increases in interest rates foisted on them by the Conservative Party and their folly. Look now at the damage that's been done. In this context, the Scottish Government has taken tough decisions on tax, asking those on higher incomes to pay more in taxation to enable investment in our public services and measures such as early learning and childcare expansion that boost economic growth. Recent analysis by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows that the 30% poorest families in Scotland, in answer to Pam Duncan Glancy's point, are on average £2,000 better off each year as a result of this government's choices. But almost unbelievably, the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland now tells us he does not support this progressive approach to taxation. What an absurdity to face the people of Scotland at this time. There are, there are presiding officer, tough choices in government. The fact that this government has been prepared to make them has enabled those, the expansion of early learning and childcare, which will be good for our children and good for our economy. I encourage the, the Parliament to give its enthusiastic support to the programme for government, which includes these essential provisions. Thank you. I now call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Joan Mason. Up to six minutes, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. Over the last few years, we've seen the former First Minister launch programmes for government boasting of strength, resilience, fairness and green credentials. But we've rarely needed to look much further than the words in their titles to find the deficit between what is promised and what is delivered. The Scottish Government's delivery deficit matters to people living and working in my constituency in the borders. It matters to people in our small towns, villages and rural communities across Scotland. And they've heard all this before. We could stand here and pick apart the frenzy, flimsy policies announced in the programme for government today. But I prefer to consider how the government intend to back up this with a real plan to deliver on what they promise. I absolutely welcome the First Minister's proposal to deliver more homes in rural areas. We need a solid plan to make rural Scotland a more attractive place to live and work. And I am sure that that is what the First Minister is getting at, although I can't see him at the moment. Um, so he'll be missing my compliments. But we need to know just how it will be delivered. And I'm not convinced by what we've heard today leaves us any the wiser. Farmers will be disappointed that they still have no idea when the new Scottish Agricultural Bill will be making its way through this Parliament, setting out the framework to support our important farming industry. Given the length of time that farmers have had to wait without the ability to plan for the long term, we need to see, and we need to see the delivery of a practical piece of legislation. So get it on the table now, I say not this pitiful lack of detail keeping farmers in the dark. I would also add that it's good to hear the First Minister committing to taking action on addressing the crisis in primary care in rural areas, but these plans have been in the pipeline for years with no progress. It's time to stop promising and start delivering. In 2020, we were promised superfast broadband across rural Scotland with the R100 scheme. We're still waiting. Last year, the government promised to improve the resilience of our ferry network. Now our island communities face more disruption than ever, and the SNP ferry fiasco continues to grow arms and legs. In one of the SNP's first ever programmes for government, it was announced that the A9 would be fully dueled by 2025. We are nowhere near that, and people's lives continue to be lost on that road. The pattern of failure is not unique to rural Scotland but it is symptomatic of the SNP Green coalition with a central belt agenda, a central belt obsession, that so many of the failures have hit rural communities the hardest, and that is hard to take. This government loves to talk about what it wants to do, but rarely discusses how it intends to do it, and when it does, it seems to lead to disaster. It rightly wants to look at protection for our marine environment, yet when it comes to making plans to do so, it completely fails to consider the impact it would have on fishing communities. It had the opportunity to gain cross-party support to improve recycling in Scotland, but instead managed to ostracise almost all of Scottish businesses. 
It has continually committed to restoring 250,000 hectares of peatland, but in every year since making this commitment, it has failed to get anywhere close to those figures. A common theme in this government's failure to deliver on promises made in recent pr programmes for government is the involvement of the Green Party. Throughout their catalogue of catastrophes, they have proven themselves wholly unfit to govern. Hamza Youssef has doubled down on his backing for the Butte House Agreement and the Green Party's reckless agenda, supporting plans to ban fishing in almost half of Scottish waters, rejecting calls from farmers to authorise the chemical azulox to control bracken, putting a block on vital road upgrades and removing the close season for managing deer. I understand that their continued presence in government provides the SNP with a helpful scapegoat when things go wrong, but I'm afraid that people living and working in rural Scotland, the dangerous influence of the Greens, coupled with the disinterest of rural policies and priorities shown by the First Minister, cannot be tolerated anymore. Presiding officer, we need a government that delivers on its promises, but we also need a plan to be pragmatic and practical and sensible. We need to see action on Scotland's real priorities. For rural Scotland, that means delivering a practical agricultural bill as soon as possible, upgrading our roads to save lives, saving our surgeries, fixing the ferry fiasco and accelerating R100. And none of this should come as a surprise though. It has been promised before. It is now time for this government, presiding officer, to get on and to deliver for the whole of Scotland. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call John Mason to be followed by Mark Griffin uh, up to six minutes. Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much, and I um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I follow Rachel Hamilton, who said that the commitments were flimsy, but I have to say that I see a lot of these as very solid and exciting uh, commitments. And presumably, if Rachel Hamilton thinks they're flimsy, she won't be opposing long-term rent controls uh, for example. But I particularly welcome also the, the fact that childcare is to be expanded, care workers to be paid £12 an hour. Of course we all want to go higher on that, but it has to be affordable. I welcome the cladding remediation bill that's to come, the comment that too much land is in the hands of too few. That is a long-term problem for Scotland, but we need to keep making...
Did you, you know you had this? Yeah, yeah. It's where Colin has to go when I'm not here to be a this camera. This is uh, <laughs> he started football training now. So oh, it's, um, two weeks so ago how's the dynamic at home with you being a referee? Uh, Are well, you like he, he just falls down the whole time? And I says, oh, <laughs> and he says, all oh, the players do that, and I says, yeah, and if yeah, they do that, they I do. tell them off. Dad gets yeah, them. Yeah, sorry. And what what uh, what age is he? Uh, four. 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 Is it? Is he at the stage where he's listening to what the coach is saying no, yet? No, so they all he's, he's quite bad in that he's there's a bit of shyness in him and uh -huh. he's fine if they're just kicking the ball, but when they ask him to do something, he just comes over to the side. Yeah. So, um, My son's a bit, because I think at his age, they, they specifically had to, because he'll be six in October, uh -huh. and they've specifically had to put out... Um, Should I not move this year? No, no, no. They'll, they'll tell you, they'll yeah, tell you. Yeah. Um, they had to put out rules saying that children were to no longer slide tackle because oh, right. obviously he's small kids yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's been his particular thing God. he doesn't score much but we're trying to say but it's not just the scoring yeah, like yeah. stopping people scoring yeah, also is a big yeah. thing like, I can hear you yep Hey, busy. I left London this morning, got the train up to Edinburgh, and I'm now doing this interview.